This is a typical British emergency exit sign and the requirement for these signs is that they have to be battery backed up and uh, they have to stay illuminated for three hours in the event of power failure. So this one uses an edge illumination system whereby they've got a graphic basically sort of held in the front and back with plastic rivets and underneath this there are a pattern of dots which are, are designed to take the light from the edge and then cast it out to the side. And up the edge of this, it's also got a set of mirrored strips so that most of the light is diverted out the front and back of the sign. And I can demonstrate that by turning this on and you'll see that it does put quite a lot of light out from the edge illumination out the front of the sign. It lights that panel evenly when it's lit by this strip of LEDs down here. So put that bit out of the way. So here's the main light itself, and the reason I was sent this is because it had reached the end of its life. Well, the battery had reached the end of its life. It's supposed to be marked. It's got little uh, tick boxes for the date here, which it's not been marked by the person who installed it. But uh, the batteries tend to last for a certain length of time, and then you're supposed to change them. In this case, this unit is quite clever. It's got a little buzzer, it's got an indicator LED, and it does self-test. So let me demonstrate what I mean by the self-tests. I'm going to power it up and it will sound alarm. It'll flash this LED red because there's a problem. So it flashed the LEDs, now it's pulsing a red LED. And the reason it's doing that is because the batteries are not actually even plugged in. So I'm going to disconnect that again. I'm going to put the connection down for the batteries. And this time when I power it up, it will just go into standard mode. Now this has two modes. It's got maintained and non-maintained. And it's got a wee switch down here that selects that. If I power it off and put it, it's in non-maintained at the moment. Uh, if I put it into maintain mode and turn it back on, it will light at full brightness. And then the event of a power failure, it will stale it. I should actually show you that I'm opening the quick test here to em emulate a power fa failure. So that's it with power, and it's brighter, and then it cuts down to a lower intensity, but it is running off the batteries now. In non-maintain mode, it uh, will charge up while the power's off. Uh, should, it will charge up with the power's on. It would be great if it did charge up the power off. It charges the power on, but does not light. This is for if you had it in an area that was normally well illuminated and only required it to illuminate the power field, that's good in a sense because it means the LEDs don't wear out over time. You find that some of the older LED signs have got a lot dimmer. But in this case, it's powered at the moment and the green LED is showing it's powered and is charging. But if the power fails, it then comes up uh, and starts lighting the... Uh, the edge of the sign so that it's visible. It's quite neat. This also has automatic test functions built in. Part of the regulations, oh, I should, before I go any further, I should show you that this is the cover for the front, which has the slot for that uh, sign to go in with a couple of bolts to hold at the top. And it lines up over the LEDs there and then the test button and the indicator go through the front of it. So the test button, uh, can be used for multiple tests. If you do a brief test, it just lights up for the duration of that test. If you press it for three seconds and watch the green LED here, one, two, three, and then you release it, it continues to flash and it's doing a 30 second test because part of the regulations for testing these, you have to test them routinely, which very well, most of them don't actually get tested. Typically on a modern installation, you'll have a little key switch which is used for... Um, turning the power off to these just briefly so you can actually test all the emergency lights. So this is currently on a 30 second test but um, and every year you have to do a much longer test. You have to do a full duration three hour test. So that's completed its test and if I was to press it and hold it for five seconds one, two, three, four, five it'll start flashing faster and it will do a full three hour test and if it fails during that time it will start flashing the red LED and it will warn a, a, put out a warning sound. It's also worth mentioning that uh, they do have the option to disconnect the sounder in here. They can cut the sounder off if you don't want the risk of it suddenly making loud beeping noises. I wonder how many people would just turn that off anyway. That's probably not a great thing but it's nice that it can warn you. It's also that kind of peeping noise that if this light up in the ceiling was beeping, you'd, you'd, it, I'm glad it's got a red flashing LED because otherwise you'd be hunting everywhere looking for what was making the noise. So let's start taking this thing to bits. We've got the LED array. I'll unplug the batteries here again before I do this. Little battery pack. 
It's interesting to note that old fittings used to have an 8 watt 12 inch fluorescent tube and they used to have a couple of or two or three D cells in them. Uh, because the LEDs take much less current, it's uh, just a couple of double A's, 1.8 amp hour and 1800 milliamp hour. So let's take this out. I quite like the fact this is modular, everything unplugs. I also noticed that this has the facility for an infrared receiver with the look of it with three extra wires. Or is that a connector? I'll find out when I take this off. So that's the LED array. It's quite nice that it's got long slots so that it uh, can allow for uh, tolerance and different fittings. It's aluminium back, so that wouldn't have a connector on the back of it for that. It would just be three wires tacked onto this, but in this case they've got a little uh, plug-in socket arrangement. They've also got the facility for the test button down on the socket board itself. I wonder if that's just uh, designed for a remote connector, although having said that, the LED and the button are also on a ro re remote connector here. The mains inlet connector here is one of these push down ones so you actually push down the connection and then you can pull the wires out freely and release them again. It's not very big which uh, anybody who is a bit old school in the electrical industry but will recall the annoyance when you had emergency light fixtures of trying to run a cable and loop it through them and the connectors were never ever big enough for that. But these days we tend to work with a, a proper good modern installation will have ceiling roses like this whereby the permanent wiring installation includes these mounted onto the ceiling or a wall or trunking and you can take the cover off and you can just physically unclip them like this and it means that, you know, every single light fitting light, an emergency light, it means that unskilled operatives or can do maintenance by changing them out because all they have to do is basically plug a new one in. It also means that uh, Skilled operatives don't have to risk inconveniencing everybody by turning the power off to the whole place before they start doing maintenance like that. The unit, this is designed to mount, mount flush into a ceiling and it's got these little wings at the side and if I uh, was to loosen this wing up and then tighten it again, it will swing out and then as I tighten it, it will pull up and that's what locks it to the ceiling. So it's quite a clever system that automatically folds out the way. Uh, to actually get it back out the ceiling again. That's quite nice. Let's uh, liberate this fixture from the case and take a look at it. I can see it's got all the suppression circuitry and it's quite nice that it's also got a, a finger guard across the mains voltage circuitry as well. I presume it's just really intended for protection against stray fingers going and touching those bits. Particularly during routine maintenance. Let's see if we can get this out then. Yes we can. Excellent, a big foam pad, what's that for? I guess it's just for a physical support of the... Oh, you know what? It's because those are live connections and if it bowed in in any way, it could potentially short against the back of the case. That'll be why there's a big pad. What do we have here? Let's take this uh, cover off. Lots of surface mount in the back, including a STC microcontroller, which isn't really surprising. There's a lot of circuitry. That's the thing about surface mount. It doesn't look like a lot because it occupies such a small area. But if this was a typical uh, through hole circuit board, that would be a lot of components. That would be occupying a large area. So what do we have? We have the incoming supply the switch that switches between maintained and non-maintained is strictly on the low voltage side. It's got good separation of the tracks though. The earth is just all common together and I'm quite pleased to see that the, although the terminals are very close here, they've actually staggered the terminals so they're all well spaced again. This is good. Uh, let's discharge the big fat capacitor, just in case. It's discharged. Finger test. So what have we got? We've got the main supply coming in. We've got what looks like a self-resetting electronic fuse. 
I wonder why self-resetting, followed immediately by a negative temperature coefficient thermistor to limit the inrush current. This is good where you've got an awful lot of fixtures in the same circuit. It just takes the sharpness off the current spike when they're turned on. Then it's got a class uh, X2 suppression capacitor for noise. Then it's got a com mode suppression choke. And then a couple of... Well, that's a capacitor. This looks like it may be a metal oxide varistor, actually. That capacitor is across the output of the com mode suppression choke. Then the metal oxide varistor, is it? Oh, yes, it is. That's uh, just across the... Hold on, I'm just going to check that with the meter. I think it's just across the input to the bridge rectifier. Continuity, we know that one is to the input, is this one? Yes, it is. So the it's got a metal oxide varistor across the input to the bridge rectifier here. The output of the rectifier then goes straight to this big, fat smoothing capacitor, which looks in good condition. And it's rated, um, hard to say actually, because the, the value is actually right round the side here, out of sight. 400 volt capacitor, let's see, let's guesstimate 10 microfarad. After that, we've got a typical switch mode power supply, presumably based around this component here. What is that? Let's uh, see if I can read that. Let's use my extra zoomy magnifier. JW2D38. JW2D38. Or is that a B? Hmm. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you decide if you, you. I don't know if you can actually even see that. Oh, probably not. I'm just. I'm just wasting time here. I'm. It's just not really working. Okay. Radio. I'm guessing that is a basically a switch mode chip. Uh, it's quite odd that there's little transistors here and everything. It's quite... Oh, that's part of the feedback because there's a opto-isolator uh, coming from that side and that then seems to be controlling the input. Odd. Um, I'm guessing that big diode there is probably part of the snubber network across to take off the transients, switching transients to the input. Uh, and then there'll be, by the look of it, from this little capacitor here, it will most likely be, yeah, with this diode. It's it's the bit that powers the chip itself. Fairly textbook. The other side, I'm not even going to try reverse engineering this. This is a microcontroller with lots of circuitry. Um, is it boosting? It's got a fuse there. Uh, is there an inductor? Is it boosting the voltage up? Or is it, oh, is, well, there's the inductor there. There's the clue. So it's got a boost circuit to actually drive the LEDs. And, yeah, this is stuff. This is absolutely... I'm not even going to try and reverse engineer on this. It does have the microcontroller, and then it's got lots of extra circuitry to drive the LEDs and monitor. It's quite complicated, isn't it? With uh, anti-tracking slots here. Between the juicy bits, it's notable that where there'd be a class uh, Y capacitor that's missing in this instance, I'm guessing they just don't think it's that important because probably because the output isn't really referenced, isn't going to reference to the, the mains ground in any way, so it's not going to radiate interference. I noticed that the uh, there's a 20 megahertz crystal, that's huge. They'll be using a crystal for the uh, chip here with its two little load capacitors purely for the timing function because it does... Uh, oh, that's also worth mentioning. When you uh, first power this up and just install it and turn the power on, after, let's see, it, it said uh, in the instructions here, it said 20 hours. It'll charge the batteries for 20 hours and then it'll automatically run a 30-second test. After four hours more, that's the full 24-hour uh, recharge duration, it will run the three-hour test itself and from that point in time, whenever you turned it on, it will then do that on a sort of regular basis. It will do the full 24-hour, the full three-hour test every year. Um, the weekly function test. So every week it will do the 30-second test and every year it will do the, uh, the full three-hour runtime. And, of course, monitor that and flash up a warning if something goes wrong. It's quite sophisticated. It's quite complex. But um, it's quite interesting for that. 
definitely not going to go too far into this uh, for reverse engineering it. They do say that if uh, one of these does develop, does show up an alarm, it's worth if the unit, uh, oh, what's the best way to put this? In the instructions, it says that if it fails the alarm, it's possibly worth just actually cycling it and letting it do a full fresh 24 hour charge because it may be that the batteries are just developing a bit of a memory effect and they just need refreshed. Um, I suppose the best way to do that is to deliberately force, wait till it's done a full recharge and then do deliberately force the long run, type, run test again uh, or just turn the power off to it. Neat. It's very smart. So who actually makes this? This particular unit is branded. It's branded Channel, Channel Safety Systems, channelsafety.co.uk. And it's rated, uh, it says wattage 7 watts. I don't think that's its full running current power. Um, I'm sure it said elsewhere it was only about 2 watts. I should Maybe I should have tested that before I, I stripped it to bits. Maybe I should test that now and see what it draws. One moment, I'm just going to set it up and test and see what its power consumption is. OK, that's it hooked up again. So if I power it up and it goes out, then it's charging now and the power consumption is about 2.5 watts. Power factor is roughly 0.5, which means that it would cost about, well, depending how you're being charged, it would cost between about £2.50 to £5 a year to run. That's good value for, for an emergency light. If I then turn the power off that's lit because it is running on batteries now and put it into maintained mode and power it up. Now it's acting as a light, so it's now consuming about two and a half watts more. It's drawing just over five watts. Power factor 0.5 again, so five or ten pounds a year to run, depending on how your uh, how your electricity is built, whether it's real power or apparent power. It's quite smart. It's very neat. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that if you you're installing this light and it's not been powered yet, when you get it, the battery lead will usually be disconnected. You connect the battery lead and the light will not light even though there's no power to it. That's to avoid running the battery flat and in the case of a large installation just having it sitting flat for a long period of time. So it will draw a small amount of current from the battery when it's been connected like that but it will only start using the battery, connect it and start acting as an emergency light when it's been powered and then disconnect it again and now it is running as an emergency light and uh, because it knows the installation is complete and it's been powered. All very smart. So yeah, that's quite a nice light. It's quite an intriguing one, particularly with its uh, self-test and its audible warning and all that for uh, making sure it does comply with the proper run times.